Good morning and uh, shalom everyone. Praise the Lord. Jai Masi. Uh, welcome to class. We are uh, chapter 8, uh, the virginal conception. And um, we began looking at this uh, studying session last, uh, I mean on Tuesday. So the first thing we said was, uh, why should we say, why is the, why can we use the term virginal conception more than virgin birth, which is more better to use, virginal conception or virgin birth. Which one is better to use? Virginal conception, why? Okay, the process of uh, incarnation or the birth of Jesus was through the uh, power of the Holy Spirit and happened in the conception, not at, not just at birth. Okay, so it is preferable to use a virgin, the, the, the phrase or the term a virginal conception. Okay, so the virginal conception of Christ is, can be understood uh, from the fact that it was the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit that brought it about. Okay, before we move on, there was a question from Andrew. Andrew, since you're in class, uh, and his question was uh, if God considers man, you know, the conception of sin was from man to man. We all are sinful because we are conceived in sin. Okay, because our great, 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 great grandfather was Adam, and he, Adam and Eve, sinned, and we are born in, hence we are all conceived or born in sin okay so his question is so when we are all conceived in sin why did god bless adam to be multiplied okay why did god bless adam to be multiplied if you're all born in sin then why did god say you know why did he bless adam and he and he said you know be blessed and be and multiply any answers that was the original will of God to showcase that, you know, he had a heart to uh, see that his children prosper and, you know, multiply. Okay, it was the will of God to see his children prosper and multiply. Okay. When I looked at this question, my first thought was, when did God bless Adam and Eve to be multiplied? Andrew, when did God bless Adam and Eve to be multiplied, to multiply? To fill the face of the earth. Before sin, before Adam and Eve fell in sin, it was their blessing. Okay, they had the blessing of work, okay, and they had the power to subdue and also to the blessing of multiplication, okay, to produce of the same kind. But when when they when they were cursed, did God bless them with that blessing? No, it was just it was before the fall. But since they were already God had already blessed them, He doesn't take away that blessing. But we are all born in sin, and that is why God had to bring about salvation, right? That is why God had to bring about salvation so that He can reconcile us back to God. Okay, so did that help, uh, uh, Andrew? Did that help answer your question? Thank you, Lucy. Okay. And uh, uh, Sanjay had posted um, a video. I had also gone through that video after class. And um, I, I wrote back to Sanjay anyways. So I just request, you know, if you have any videos, anything that you like to post regarding what we are learning, it's good to do that, uh, you know, before class, run it past the teacher. And if the teacher says, OK, we can post it on the stream page, but not during class uh, time, a lecture, because it will be a little disturbing. And also uh, check with the teacher if it's an appropriate um, video to show. So the, the video that he posted, um, I don't know if, if any of you watched it, but then he was talking about how the blood of Jesus had only the chromosomes of his the mother. Okay, it had only one set of chromosomes, not 
the father, but of just of the mother. But then I posed a question to to Sanjay, asking him where did this person get the blood of Jesus? Because there was no body in the tomb. Was the body of Jesus there? Was the body of Jesus buried? There was no body. Where did he get the blood from? Okay. So we're not going to it now, but you know. Uh, anyway, he he wrote back saying that it's not a. Uh, uh, there's quite some discrepancies, so we'll not get into it. But um, it's a good video to look at and and think about it. But I don't want to uh, dwell on it. Okay, some archaeological evidences and all that, but it's not um, right. We just go with what the Bible says, and of course, people are trying to prove their faith and their understanding of God. Okay. Okay, so we'll move on. We looked at also the doctrinal importance of the virgin birth. Um, we saw that at least in two areas, what is the importance of the virginal conception of Jesus? Um, two areas is it shows that salvation ultimately must come from God himself. Salvation is not the work of man. It cannot be brought about by man's own work or power. But salvation is the power of, is is through the power of God alone and not through human effort. Okay, so salvation can never come through human effort, but only is the work of God Himself. So that is one of the doctrinal importance of the virginal conception, okay, and the virgin birth of Jesus. The second thing is that it was um, the virginal conception of the virgin birth made it possible for humanity and divinity or humanity and deity to coexist in perfect unity in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, so we can even think of various permutations and combinations or possibilities how God could have done this without a virgin giving birth to uh, the virginal conception and a virgin giving birth to Jesus. We can think of other means, but you know, if you look at various other possibilities, for example, one possibility could be what if God created Jesus completely as a human being in heaven and just send him down to earth without any human parents. Now, if we had somebody like that, then what would be, what would be our understanding of God? Or what do you think uh, would be? be hard for us to see Jesus as. If God created Jesus as a complete human being and just send him from heaven down to earth, you know, uh, without any human parents, okay, then how would our understanding of Jesus be? Or what would our understanding of Jesus be? Or how would it be hard for us to comprehend Jesus? It would uh, be a more on a uh, easier note that uh, he didn't live like a human, so it was easy as a god. He came as God. He stayed as God. He dwelt as God, and he left, ascended back as God. So that would be the instinct. Thing. Okay, uh, maybe you were saying that uh, it would be hard to see how he was human like us in every way. No, you would have felt it is easy for him. He came as God. Okay. Directly, uh, it was no, easy for him. But for I'm talking about from our yes, perspective. our perspective, we would have felt it was easy because it was just God. Rather, now what's actually happened? He came and stayed with us. He came in as a virgin well, birth, as okay. lived in the flesh. So he's endured whatever we endure. He's endured. So now we can resonate much better. You can resonate much better. Understand him much better. Yes, rather than him just coming down as a human being. Okay, Lucy says only divinity could be considered. Yes, uh, we can understand only his divine, uh, his his divine form or his divine role, but we cannot understand how he can be human in in the fullest sense. Sanjay says he wouldn't be fully man. He would be more like an alien from another planet of um, existence. Yes. For us, he would be like alien, like just exactly like you said, yes, alien, because we can't understand or comprehend how he can be or he, uh, how he can understand our frailties and our human weaknesses. Okay. So if, what is the second probability? If on the other hand, what if God, you know, could have Jesus come into this world with both a father and a mother? 
okay and somewhere after he was born you know miraculously he would have just put his divine nature in his human nature okay what would be our understanding of jesus then i'll repeat it what if jesus was born into this world with both father and mother okay and after his birth somewhere in the miraculous way god just put his divine divine nature okay or his divine nature miraculously into jesus's human nature how would it be for us to think about god or Sister, jesus yes through mankind it is uh, he would become a sinner he would never be sinless yes we can never see him as sinless because he was conceived in sin because he's born to both parents okay he was just conceived just like us so he will be no different from any one of us so it will be hard for us to understand how jesus was fully god when his origin was just like us just like us in every way just like we are born in sin okay so we see that god in his wisdom you know um ordained or thought of this perfect way of or a perfect combination of how humanity and divinity can coexist can influence the birth of jesus you know can be evident to us from the fact how he was fully human how he was fully um, uh, divine from his conception through his birth through his life here on the earth and so god in his you know divine wisdom ordained it to be you know for jesus to be conceived in the womb of a virgin through the power of the holy spirit and it was the work of the holy spirit and so by this there was a perfect um, you know unity of humanity and divinity that coexisted in the person of jesus christ that is why we read in that um uh in that verse in luke chapter 1 was um you know was uh yeah was 35 you know and the angel answered and said to her the holy spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you overshadow you therefore also that the holy one who is to be born will be called the son of god okay so it was through the power of the holy spirit that uh jesus was conceived in the womb of mary and he was born so there was the perfect coexistence of humanity and divinity that existed in the person of jesus christ okay and also virginal conception made it possible for christ through humanity uh to come into existence without inheriting sin okay so jesus did not have a human father that that line of descent from adam is per, pa, was per, partially interrupted okay jesus did not you know descend from adam exactly in the same way in which other human beings uh, descended from adam just like all of us descended from adam you know for jesus that descent from adam was partially interrupted okay because we know that the holy spirit um you know came upon um mary and you know um and the child that was born is was holy okay so it was because the spirit brought about this conception in um the womb of mary that the child was to be called holy okay so we must never think that you know um we must never take this to be that the transmission of sin is only from the father not from the mother so can so people can question and ask okay if jesus was not born to you know uh, the union of a father and mother and you know the partial line of descent was broken of adam to the father you know it does not mean that we inherit sin only from a father's uh, lineage or uh, from the generation of our fathers so you can say that you know what was mary sinless you can ask that question right was mary sinless if jesus had to be sinless 
you know, he was not born in sin, but he was conceived in, in Mary's womb. And uh, so was Mary sinless? Hmm? Okay. Deepu says no. Kofi says no. Yes, from Adam he did not inherit sin, he was, so he was sinless. So did Jesus not inherit sinful nature from Mary? The Roman Catholic Church says that Mary was free from sin. But does the scripture tell us that? She was, says she was blessed, Sanjay says she was pious, but born in sin like all of us. Scripture no way or nowhere attributes that Mary was sinless okay so nowhere that scripture teaches this okay um but even then does not solve the problem anyway but for us to just know what scripture says is that it's the work of the holy spirit so the through the work of the holy spirit the holy spirit must have prevented not you know the uh, not only the transmission of sin from joseph but, uh, you know, because Jesus had no human father, but also the Holy Spirit would, in a miraculous way, also would have prevented the transmission of sin from Mary. Because it says in uh, chapter 1 of Luke, verse 35, that the Holy Spirit will come upon you, therefore the child who is to be born is to be called or will be called holy. Okay. So these are some of the questions that can come up and as students of Christology, as students of theology, you will, you will have to answer these questions. So that is why I'm mentioning it for us. Okay. So for those of them who do not accept the complete truth of scripture, you know, they are people who deny or do not believe in virginal conception or the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. But if your belief and your faith is based on what scripture says, then you will certainly not deny this doctrine or you will certainly not deny this teaching. Okay. So um, whether or not we could can discern or understand how all of this took about, you know, the doctrinal importance for this teaching is that we should just believe it simply because of what scripture tells us. Okay. We can't prove it scientifically. We can't talk, debate about it. We just believe it, first of all, simply because Scripture states this, Scripture affirms this. And, you know, this is a miracle or the supernatural working of God. And nothing is impossible with God. Okay. Because, you know, um, um, just like, like God did many other miracles in the Bible, is nothing that is impossible with him. So it, the virgin birth, the virginal conception was not an impossibility for God. Okay. And the other thing is we need to understand that in the biblical teaching on the person of, if we need to understand the biblical teaching of the person and work of Jesus Christ correctly, it's important that we begin by believing his virginal conception and his virgin birth. Okay. So if you want to understand the person and work of Jesus Christ, then it's important for us to, you know, affirm this doctrine of virginal conception or the virgin birth. So sometimes we just believe it by faith. We just go with what the word of God says because God has spoken. God has said, God has planned it this, this way and nothing is impossible with God. Because even Mary says, how is this possible and what does God say? With God, with God, nothing is impossible. Okay, even when a um, person comes to Jesus and says, "Then who then can be saved?" God says, "With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible." Okay, so verse uh, Luke chapter one verse thirty seven says, "For with God, nothing will be impossible." Yes, it seems as an impossibility, but with God, nothing is impossible. So we just believe the virginal conception and the virgin birth by faith because of what God has planned, God has ordained and what he has said. Okay. So any questions? Andrew says, ma'am, how did Jesus 
come the lineage of David without any blood connection of J Joseph, uh, not marriage. Okay. So how did he come in? Because, yeah, not through the blood connection, but his father was Joseph. Okay. So through that, we just, you know, again, we can't think or we can't explain, but his father was Joseph. And so, you know, he was maybe like an adoption, you know, and also into the family or the lineage of um, David. Yes, good question. Any other questions? Anyone else has? Mary was in the lineage of David. Yes, I was even thinking of the same thing. Uh, I don't know. We need to look at um, Matthew chapter 1. Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, if you look at the tradition of uh, uh, was that Mary was believed to be in the lineage of David. Yes, according to the uh, Christian tradition. But if you look at um, the New Testament, both Gospel of Matthew and Gospel of Luke uh, provide, you know, genealogies of Jesus that connects to, to the line of the lineage of David. But you need to see whether it's from Joseph or from Mary. Joseph, Joseph, right. But Christian tradition says Mary, the mother of Jesus, is believed to be of the lineage of David. Sorry. Can you use the mic, please? Matthew 1.16 overrides that. It says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Yes. So Mary, who was uh, Joseph, who is the husband of Mary. Yeah. Sister. Yes, Kofi. Um, I I think uh, Mary Elizabeth, who happens to be a Levite, is a relative of Mary. Yes. So there is also the likelihood that Mary is a Levite, and not. Okay. From Judah. And not, sorry? And not a descendant of Judah. Okay. That of David. So you're saying that uh, that she was a Levite? Yes. Yes. So, if yeah. That is, if she is related to Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. Yes. So Lucy had mentioned that. Lucy had put in the post. But Elizabeth is uh, in the Gospel of Luke uh, is, you know, is called or referred to as being uh, the daughter of Aaron, um, which is belonging. Aaron was the priest, belonging to the priestly lineage of Aaron. So rather than the yes, the ro royal lineage of David, you're right. Yes. So Elizabeth's lineage is not uh, traced back to David in the Bible. You're right. But Christian tradition says that you know the tradition. I'm not saying the Bible says, but the Christian tradition says that Mary is of the lineage of David. Um, you know, but we don't have, does, the Bible does not explicitly state that Mary is of the lineage of David. Only the Christian tradition, you know, um, that is long being held based on the genealogies provided in the Gospels that, uh, you know, the significance of Jesus being descended from David as prophesied in the Old Testament. But Joseph was from the lineage of David, yes. And Elizabeth is, um, you know, is not tra her lineage is not traced back to David, like Kofi said, but to the priestly lineage of uh, Aaron, uh, because she's called as one of the daughters of Aaron in in Luke chapter one verse five. Yeah. Thank you, Kofi. 
okay good thoughts good thinking anyone else any other questions you all have on this lesson or we move on to the next chapter So yes, we can just, um, you know, uh, say that even though uh, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and was born of the Virgin Mary, okay, but when you look at the genealogies of, um, of Jesus in Matthew, it traces back the lineage of uh, uh, Joseph, okay, uh, who was a descendant of David. So although Joseph was not the biological father, okay, but, you know, was... Anyway, consider, like I said, the legally adopted son. Uh, so Jesus was, you know, we can say in that in that way, the legal right to the lineage of David. Okay. Okay, we'll continue. Uh, any other questions anyone else has? Before we move on to the ninth chapter. Very interesting chapter. Any questions? Okay. Uh, the ninth chapter, we are looking at the sinless lamb. Okay. Who is the sinless lamb? Jesus. Okay. So we are looking at now the work of Jesus Christ. Okay. Jesus is uh, referred to as a lamb uh, over 30 times in the New Testament. Okay. 30 times in the New Testament. Um, so we in this chapter, we're just basically going to look at this title and role of Christ uh, as this title that is given to him as the sinless lamb and his role as the sinless lamb. We look at it both from the Old and the New Testament. We look at how it is in the Old Testament and how Jesus fulfilled it in his, pers in his role um, and his work um, in the New Testament. Okay. So, John chapter 1 was 29. Can somebody read that, please? John chapter 1 was 29. John chapter 1 was 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. So, here we see that um, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming towards him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, why do you think John the Baptist is saying this? Why doesn't why does he say, hey, look, everyone, that's the Messiah. All of you are looking for the Messiah. Here's the Messiah. Why does he say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? The prophecy to be fulfilled, okay. Why else? So they could connect, you know, the Jewish people were always having lamb as a sacrifice in the Old Testament. Okay. So because they could uh, understand now oh, this lamb is the actual sacrifice for all the remission of sins. Yes. Thank you. Uh, he didn't say, hey, look, the Messiah, because what was the Jews looking for? What kind of Messiahs they were looking for? Yes, they were looking for a political Messiah. A king would come and free them from their enemies. And you know, um, give them the freedom they need and, uh, you know, be the king and rule over them, okay? So here Jesus, uh, John the Baptist is saying, behold the Lamb of God. Because uh, for the Jews, they were very familiar with this term, Lamb. Okay? Day in and day out, they were, you know, sacrifices were just uh, being made and Lamb was so much part of their rituals Okay, and we look at it in our study today. Okay, so John is saying, hey, the Messiah is actually the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. And the Messiah who's come is not the king. He's, he's the one who's going to be the Lamb who's going to make the 
sacrifice. Okay. So, and another beautiful thing to note here, it says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It does not just say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the nation of Israel or the sins of believers or Christians. It says, It takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus came to be that sinless Lamb to make that full sufficient sacrifice for the whole world. Okay, so we we'll look at how and we'll study how Christ, as the sinless lamb, uh, and uh, uh, became that lamb that you know was used in the Old Testament for making sacrifices, and um, how these Old Testament sacrifices, you know, uh, of sacrificing the lamb, basically very clearly and specifically you know, pointed out at somebody who will come way into the future, that is Jesus Christ. So remember I told you all of the ceremonies, all of the rituals, all of the sacrifices that God had instituted in the, or, um, you know, set up in the Old Testament was all pointing out to the person and the work of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Isn't that beautiful? You know, it was not just a ritual that he wanted people to do. That is why Paul also says that God, that when Jesus came, he redeemed us from the curse of the law. He, he redeemed us from these vain rituals and traditions because Jesus did not come or God did not put us into rituals and traditions, uh, but he came, he used all of that to point out to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Okay, so we're going to look at how the Old Testament sacrifices spoke clearly and specifically about the various aspects of Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God. So the first one we will look at as the Paschal Lamb or the Passover Lamb. Okay, uh, Exodus chapter 12 verses 1 to 14. So can somebody read Exodus chapter 12 verses 1 to 14 for us please? Exodus. Sister. You can read the sister. Okay. Yes, go ahead, Sister Gertrude. Now, Exodus 12, 1 to 14. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take it on the two dope posts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herb they shall eat it do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water but roasted in fire its head with its legs and its bill you shall let none of this remain until morning and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire and thus you shall eat it with the belt on your waist your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. 
so this day shall be to you a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the lord throughout your generation you shall keep it as a feast by the everlasting ordinance amen thank you sister getrude so here in this passage uh, god was preparing to deliver his people from where from slavery in egypt and lead them to the promised land which is canaan okay which he promised to give them and god at this time is in instituting the feast of the passover and he says that this feast of this passover has to be how long they should should they keep this feast of the passover how long look at verse 14 How long should they keep the feast of the Passover? Or how many times uh, to celebrate it? Sorry, through throughout the generations. Yes, as an everlasting ordinance. Ordinance. Okay. So saying here that note these words. Okay. Verse fourteen. So this day shall be to you a memorial. Memorial means what? something that you remember celebrate you shall keep it as a feast to lord throughout your generation you shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance what is the meaning of everlasting ha huh? everlasting means there's no end then why aren't we celebrating the passover feast says here god saying you shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance why aren't we celebrating the passover you need to use the mic please because this is a lamp of because jesus is our lamp. passover lamb okay why don't we celebrate the passover have you ever thought of it it says here you have to celebrate it as an everlasting ordinance Why? Why don't we celebrate? Christ was already sacrificed for us. Yes, Christ already became that Passover lamb. Okay, He made that full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice. We no longer have to celebrate it. But do we celebrate it in one sense? What He has done? Do we celebrate what He has done on the cross in one sense? How? Yes, sister. How? We celebrate it through Holy Communion. Yes, the Lord's Table, the Lord's uh, Supper. Thank you, the Holy Communion. Okay, so we we keep doing that. We celebrate what Jesus has done for us. Okay, so Jesus. How do we know that Jesus is the Passover Lamb? Because Paul spoke about it. He, you know, he points out to Jesus's redemptive work, um, and he spoke as Jesus as the Passover. Lamb in the New Testament, First Corinthians chapter five verse seven. Can somebody read that, please? First Corinthians chapter five verse seven. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So Paul is through the power of the Holy Spirit, or the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's saying, he's telling us that Christ is our Passover. and Christ was sacrificed for us okay now the first part of the verse says therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you are truly unleavened what does it mean what does it this mean this leaven purge out the old leaven you know so that you can be a new lump who's truly un unleavened Okay, it means old traditions. Okay, yes. What else? What does leaven mean? Bread. Actually, leaven is yeast. Yeast that is used for bread or bun that makes it nice and spongy and fluffy and soft. Okay. So um, in the in the in the Old Testament, how how did people get leaven how or how do they use that as yeast for the new leaven any idea 
they actually used to use a pinch or a little of the dao the that old one. sorry they used the old one they kept a small piece and they used it and they kept on using like that continuation like how you make yogurt yes how you make yogurt how you make curd you use little of the old curd and you put it in the new milk and then it you know curdles okay so they use a pinch of or a little of the old dao that was there of the previous batch and they use it to make the new batch uh, the new dao uh, in the new batch or the new bread you know a little sour and uh, as yeast so this is how bread was commonly uh, made in the ancient world okay so a little of the old dough when you put it in the new one the new dough or the new bread will rise up and puff up okay so that is the way the leaven used to uh, work so you know uh, here leaven basically illustrates the work of sin or lust or pride okay so how does sin pride and lust work it's just like this leaven okay so just a presence of a little sin in your life in your mind in your body okay can corrupt the entire being okay just a little sin so just like a little leaven can you know make the new batch of dove fluffy and you know uh, the dove to rise up just in the same way little sin a presence of little sin can corrupt the entire person okay so here paul is uh, writing and saying purge out the old leave it okay so we see that at the passover what does god tell them all leave and should be removed from the house don't have any old dove in your house remove everything nothing with leave and that was there had to be eaten that whole week so paul is basically why is he using this illustration of leaven and connecting it with jesus as a passover lamb because god had told them remove every leaven from your midst for one week you should not eat food with you know with leaven okay so paul is saying just like that you know the the uh, just as the jews were so concerned to remove all leaven from their midst when they celebrate the passover festival so also he's telling the believers the church that you know they should remove everybody who is uh, who is unrepentant sinners those who are going back to their old ways those who are living in old sinful ways they need to remove them from their midst so that is what he is talking about here and then he is talking about the old testament piece of the passover which is you know pointing out to jesus as the passover lamb okay so the old testament feast of the passover was basically a type and shadow of the redemptive work of jesus christ in the new testament have you heard this words type and shadow have you heard some things in the old and old testament are a type and shadow of the new covenant the old covenant is type and shadow of new covenant or the old Uh, the rituals in the old testament or the covenants that are made in the old testament this is the type and shadow of the redemptive work of jesus christ in the new testament have you heard this word type and shadow before yes no okay what is the meaning of type sorry similar okay it just basically means an example or it means a pattern okay a model so it describes a model or a pattern in the old testament that is basically fulfilled in the life and ministry of jesus christ okay so things are in the old testament okay which is an example a type a pattern a model in the old testament is basically fulfilled in the life and ministry of jesus christ okay so basically type means um model pattern um uh, a print or a manner a figure a fashion that was something that was done in the old testament but that is seen in the new testament in the person and work of jesus christ so that is the meaning of type so what do we mean type and shadow what is shadow 
Okay, shadow is a reflection, yes. Shadow by itself has no substance, yes or no? Shadow by itself has no substance, yes or no? Yes, but it's cast by something that is more substantial. Okay, I am someone who's substantial. When I stand in the sun, you can see my shadow, which has no substance. Okay, so it's basically, uh, when you talk about the shadow, Jesus is a type and shadow of the Old Testament to choose, you're basically saying that in the physical form of something that is a heavenly reality. Okay? The physical form or the physical being of something that is a heavenly reality. So basically all of the Jewish rituals and sacrifices or the ceremonies that were done in the Old Testament were a shadow okay, cast by heavenly realities which was seen in the life and work and the kingdom of God that Jesus came to establish. So everything that we see about what Jesus did, his life, his ministry, the kingdom of God that he came to establish was a reality, yes or no? People could touch, feel in a very tangible way, experience all of the person and the work of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God that he came to uh, established here on earth was a reality. But in the Old Testament, all this was a type and shadow of this reality that we see, that we experience, that we can understand, which, we, which is more tangible and made more alive to us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Are you able to understand? What you are just... So type and shadow don't have to worry. It's just basically things that happen in the Old Testament, you know, uh, just like an example, a model, you know, a pattern that was seen fulfilled in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. That's why I said all of the ceremonies, all of the ceremonies, all of the rituals, all of the traditions, all of the sacrifices that were made in the Old Testament were seen fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So everything ultimately pointed out to, you know, something that was far more greater than what was done in the Old Testament, and that was pointing out to Jesus Christ. Okay, Sanjay says, the bronze servant which Moses made in the wilderness was a type and shadow of the future crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Yes, it's a type and shadow of what Jesus would come and do. So everybody who look at the cross will be saved, just like in the Mo time of Moses, when they were bit by the venomous snakes, you know, God told Moses, make this bronze serpent, put it on a pole. Everyone who looks at it will be saved. Okay. So that was a type and shadow of what Jesus would fulfill on the cross. Okay. In the same way, the Old Testament Passover, it's a type and shadow or it's a figure of Christ who was a true Passover lamb. So the Passover celebration that they had, the Passover lamb was pointing out, was a type and shadow, was pointing out at someone far greater that was Jesus Christ who would become that Passover lamb. So the Old Testament Passover feast was pointing out to the true lamb of God, who he would be, what he would be like and what he would accomplish. Okay. Now, there are some important characteristics of the Passover lamb that we clearly see in Jesus Christ. Okay, so what is the uh, characteristic of the Passover lamb? What did Jesus, uh, what did God say? What kind of lamb they had to choose? A lamb that was unblemished. That means a lamb that was without any spot, sickness, lame. And the same way we see that Jesus became that perfect, complete, spotless, whole lamb. Okay, and we read this in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, which tells us that Christ was that lamb without blemish and without spot. Okay, we'll stop here. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? You all are able to understand? Able to understand? Uh, online students, you are able to understand? Yes, thank you. Okay. Any questions anyone has? Thank you, everyone. Okay, if there are no questions, so we'll end class here. Have a blessed weekend, everyone, and I'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you.
sorry oh sorry friday <laughs> oh sorry today is tuesday i mean an old world thank you andrew yeah